Today, we're going to explore one of the lesser-known events leading up to the Zoot Suit Riots, the murder of Jose Diaz at Sleepy Lagoon. I've got a great guest on board for the show today. This is the Lowrider Samurai Podcast. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the Lowrider Samurai. Here's your host, Brandon Lauren Maxwell. My guest today is a professor of history at Arizona State University and a former host of the popular PBS series History Detectives. He is a frequent guest lecturer on topics such as the American West, Latinos in the United States, American youth subculture, and American religion. He is also the author of multiple books, including the one we're going to talk about today entitled The Murder at Sleepy Lagoon, Zoot Suits, Race and Riot in Wartime L.A., a book that documents the 1942 Sleepy Lagoon murder trial in Los Angeles, which led to the wrongful conviction of 17 Mexican-American youth for the alleged gang slaying of Jose. Diaz. And this would become just one of many events in the lead up to the Zoot Suit Riots, and that's why it matters. His name is Eduardo Pagan. Mr. Pagan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So before we dive too deep into uh, Sleepy Lagoon and the incident that happened in Jose Diaz and and why his murder matters, uh, why don't you go ahead and set the scene at the time for our listeners? Well, in terms of kind of, you know, trying to get ourselves back into what the domestic, uh, what the home life was like in the 1940s, particularly in 1942, I would say there's there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. One is um, the war wasn't going well for the American forces, for the Allied forces. And, you know, that wasn't common knowledge. It wasn't uh, published in the newspaper headlines. But what what you didn't see is you didn't see... Um, a lot of news and a lot of information about how well the war was going. Um, there wasn't a lot of news about uh, advances or fronts uh, that were advancing towards uh, uh, towards Berlin. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of concern. Uh, you know, and, and I, I guess I would say this is is that often we in the present we look back at the past and, and assume that what happened was a foregone conclusion. But when you're living in the moment, you have no idea what's going to happen next. And when you're involved in a worldwide war, th- there's a lot of anxiety about how this is all going to turn out. So there's that in terms of the the international scene. But I would I would also say in terms of the home scene, the home front. Um, the war effort uh, had a tremendous impact on social relations. It completely um, upended everything. Everything that was considered normal before the war was gone. And it was primarily because this was an all-out effort, and all able-bodied men uh, were marshaled you know, in one form or another to, to fight this war. You know, Either they were sent abroad or they were, they were drafted in, in the support uh, mission of, 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 of the army and the, the military. Um, And so with all of these men moving into the military, they're out of the American workforce, and that necessitated women moving into the workforce. And so right away, you've got a dramatic change uh, in American society and American economy in terms of women moving into the the workforce in, in unprecedented ways and unprecedented numbers. And what's interesting, and one of the things that I do when I start off on a research project is I, um, I just read all the newspapers that I can, and I just start from one day and just keep reading, because I want to know what's on the minds of people. What are they reading? What are they thinking about? And I, partic- I pay particular attention to the, the letters to the editors. And it's very, very clear that in, 19, in the early 1940s, particularly 1942, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of discussion about what they characterize as juvenile delinquency. Um, they didn't use the term latchkey children, but that captures exactly what people were concerned about. In other words, dad's off fighting the war, mom's in the factory making all the munitions. Who's watching over the children? And what are they doing with their time? And so there was, there was a lot of discussion about um, uncontrolled children. Um, and and that you know that that society home front society was falling apart because the traditional figures that would be in charge of that were no longer around. Okay, so I think that's really interesting um, right there because aside from 
the, the change in the workforce that was happening, um, nationalism, like you said, was, was on the kind of, it was a, an all out effort um, on behalf yeah. of, of the U.S. government to kind of create this unified nation. And there were also policies uh, that were implemented like uh, rationing. Am I correct? They had to do with cloth yeah. and things like that. So yeah. now that manifested itself in addition to, I guess, the national sentiment um, in a lot of, I think, anti-Mexican-American sentiment um, in addition to the, the, the perceived delinquency at the time. Am I correct? Yeah, in a very curious kind of way, it did. Yeah, it wasn't a. a it was one of the the multiple uh, social tensions that was at work during this time. Yeah. Okay. So, what was the difference between the perceived delinquency um, at that period during the war and gangs that had previously existed prior to the war? Well, you know, there, there's a very interesting discussion among scholars, and I would even call it a debate whether, you know, these groups of young people were gangs or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I, from my perspective, um, I, I tend to side on, on this, the side that they were not gangs in any way that we think of gangs today. Right. You know, we, when we think of gangs, we're so used to thinking about the Bloods and the Crips, about uh, MS-13, uh, in compared to what we think of as gangs these kids weren't gangs in the 1940s. Um, that's my perspective. I mean, there there would be other arguments to the contrary. No, I um, think I would agree with you because you had uh, so you have I think neighborhoods you have that became yeah. what they are now became larger gangs. Um, but I feel like in the late 1800s, where where some of the oldest neighborhoods can be traced to, like Dogtown, Dogtown Rifa, for example, 38th Street, Big Hazard, all these gangs that, that started in the early 1900s, late 1800s. They weren't necessarily what we saw today. Um, they were neighborhoods um, that might have been segregated and whatnot. Um, you had car clubs, you had family names and things like that. But what changed, I think, as a result of the war? Again, going back to if you could put your as much as we can to the present, if we put our mm-hmm. minds to the 1940s, um, that term itself, gain, uh, was very consciously used by the critics of... Um, young people who had a lot of free time on their hands and who were unsupervised. And the term was a very loaded term coming out of the 1930s when uh, when you spoke of gangs, you thought of Al Capone. And so mm. to kind of splash them with that same tent, taint or that same paint was an effort to try and, and demonize uh, young kids that from my perspective, they were just neighborhood kids who were hanging out with each other. Um, and they were just trying to find ways of, of coping with life. Um, so uh, it was a very loaded term to be using in the 1940s, but it was used intentionally as a way of trying to demonize young people. Now, the question about how does race come into this, and it's, it's, again, it's one of the complicated strands. Uh, the, the language about gangs and the characterization of juvenile delinquents wasn't limited to only uh, young people of color back in the 1940s. There was a lot of press about white kids as well, working class white kids. Where things get really interesting goes when you start uh, dealing with uh, Mexican-American youth in particular um, as the children of immigrants. And these are the children of refugees from the Mexican Revolution. And so now you've got this language that's already loaded uh, gangs that's being applied to young kids. Mm -hmm. And then you've got anti-immigrant sentiment that's also coming out of the 1930s and 1920s. Uh, you know, this is, this is a period of, of um, 100% Americanism, right? So there's this echo of all of that coming, coming to play in the 1940s. It's also tangling up into the, the social tensions of this particular period. So it takes a particular slant when it's used with uh, Mexican-American kids. But, you know, I would say this as well. The 30 street kids, I mean, this was uh, what we might characterize as an integrated neighborhood. Uh, they weren't all Mexican Americans. Um, there were uh, there were Jews. There were Armenians. Uh, there were working class white kids as well uh, in this group. So they weren't. Uh, this wasn't a, a Mexican American neighborhood per se. Right. Um, a lot of yeah. people don't know that. A lot of people don't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. See, and this is kind of interesting about how uh, this this historic moment has come to be preserved in in uh, kind of in the popular consciousness. Uh, most people, if they they access this moment, they do so through um, the movie Zoot Suit Riot or the play. 
And, uh, you know, that was written in a very particular moment in, of time of kind of a cultural nationalism. And Luis Valdez, you know, wrote this in the, he began thinking about this in the 1960s and, and wrote this play in this, this moment of cultural ferment among Mexican Americans who wanted to make a particular statement about who they were. And so he read backwards into his history or into the history of, of California, a, a lot of 1960s assumptions. And so, yeah, you get this kind of characterization that this moment is exclusively Mexican-American, and it's not. Mm. Um, the, the tensions are much broader than that. So with Jose Diaz, um, yeah. who, who's the focus of, of this murder that we're kind of talking about, or was a focus yeah. of, of the book you wrote um, about the murder at Sleepy Lagoon, uh, who was yeah. he at that time? Oh, Jose Diaz. Um, the best that I could piece together was that, you know, he was just a good kid. Uh, he was the oldest brother of a large family. Uh, he himself was the son of, of uh, refugees from the, the Mexican Revolution. He came to the United States when he was two years old, and so this was the only country he ever really knew. Um, and he grew up working in the, the fields of Southern California. And by all accounts, he was kind of like the older brother that uh, that everyone wished they had. He looked out for his brothers and sisters. He was a good son. I mean, he was just a good kid all the way around. Um, so he, and he, he had just no was, history uh, leading up. No, no, event. no, no, no. He was he was not the kind of kid that would be hanging around on street corners. He had no history with the LAPD. Uh, he was a good kid. I mean, again, he, he worked hard. Uh, he he shared his wages with his family, uh, you know, pulled their wages together. I mean, he was just, there was, there was n- nothing, um, nothing negative that could be, really be said about Jose Diaz. Uh, like I said, he was just a good kid all the way around. Okay, so one night uh, in Commerce, California, that's where Sleepy Lagoon was located, am I correct, at that time? <laughs> You know, uh, probably and the reason why I say this is because, you know, I've I've gone to locate the, the site, and I'm pretty sure, sure that I've located the site. There's a business park on it now. Right. Which m- municipality does it fall in? Is is it? Uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure which one it falls into, but you're probably right. Yeah, it's Commerce or somewhere very close to it. Okay. So so Jose one night is found. Uh, is he bleeding on the side of the road from stab wounds? <laughs> Yeah, so Jose, you know, as I said, he grew up, um, this is the country's only country he's ever known. He was not subject to the draft, as far as I know, because he was not, uh, he was not an American citizen, but he volunteered nonetheless. And he was going to report uh, on a Monday morning, and there was a birthday party that was held on a Saturday night, and if my memory serves me correctly now, this was 2nd of August, uh, 1942. And uh, Jose was living out in what was then rural California. It's not rural anymore, but back in the 1940s it was. And uh, it was a large uh, ranch, and there were a number of families that lived on this ranch, and they just they worked the fields. Um, and these ranch families got together to celebrate a birthday party of one of the young girls that was living on there, and Jose was was included because he was, again, he was part of this little nexus of, of uh, working families that lived on this ranch. It was called the Williams Ranch. And uh, so the party goes on. It's a typical Mexican party. You know, lots of, lots of food. Uh, they had a little orchestra playing, um, uh, uh, beer flowing as well. Um, everything goes as, you know, and, and there were, there were uh, parents and children, you know, I mean, this is just uh, several families getting together. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing suspicious about this particular party. What happens about 11 o'clock at night, there was, there was a group of, of boys from Downey, and they were, uh, they themselves were, I've later come to find out, were uh, largely immigrant uh, youths, European immigrants, um, they uh, were working class kids. European immigrants. They came. European immigrants, yeah, yeah. Uh, Russian, uh, some of them. Um, they came and they crashed the party. They wanted beer. And they were thrown out of the party. They weren't invited guests. Um, and as they were thrown out of the party, they, uh, they drove out. And, and again, this is on dirt roads. Um, and on the way out, they, they accost some kids who are off in the distance who are necking in a car. And this is something that the Downey boys were known to do. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, they were known to Downey as the chain gang, right? This was, this was the, how they were known. Um, and there's a fight that takes place, which I'll have to come back to later on. Mm-hmm. But so, so from, from the perspective of Jose Diaz, though, nothing, uh, there's nothing negative that happens at this party until this, this moment about 11 o'clock. These gate cra- crashers come, they're thrown out. Party continues on until about 1 o'clock in the morning. By that time, most people kind of go home. Jose is about, he's one of the last people to be, uh, to be seen at the party. He's drunk by this point. And I should add that he's not a drinker. Uh, he didn't drink beer. Um, but I suspect what happened was because he's, he's going into, to join the army. A lot of people were probably saying, here, have one on me. And they were, they were probably giving him money as, as a gift, well wishes. So he had money on him and he was drunk. And we know he was drunk by the forensic evidence as well. He was pretty drunk, pretty smashed. And uh, he was last seen leaving the party in the company of two other young men who lived on this ranch about one o'clock in the morning. He is next found uh, bleeding and mortally wounded on the side of a dirt road. Uh, but that's where the, the story gets very, very complicated, Dan, about who, mm-hmm. who beat Jose Diaz. Now, yeah. following, now he wasn't dead yet, correct? He was still alive? N- he was still alive um, by the medical reports. He could, he could kind of barely answer some questions about who he was, but he never really gained full consciousness after that point. So he's never able he to died identify. About four... No, 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 no. Okay, so no. He goes, they take him to the hospital. Now, this creates yeah. uh, a panic at the time, right? Because this was, was one of what was perceived by the public to be a number of incidences between youth. Yeah, so that, that weekend was an unusually violent weekend in Los Angeles. Uh, there were a number of other clashes between young people. And I wouldn't say they were all Mexican-American. Now these, again, these are working-class whites. Uh, just, just a number of youth violent activities on that particular weekend. And when he died, um, this is when um, the Attorney General sent down a mandate to the uh, LAPD, but also to the LA Sheriff's Office to do something about this, to do something about youth gangs that were getting out of control. So what happens then was that his death becomes politicized. And the law enforcement agencies of Los Angeles and Los Angeles County become invested in trying to find the murderers of Jose Diaz and prosecute them with the full extent of the law. Mm. Now, is at this point they had had they had done roundups yet? Is this what preceded the roundups no. they eventually did? Okay, so what happened? Yeah, to that? my knowledge, yeah, they 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 had not done roundups. Uh, to my to my knowledge, this was the first, and so both the uh, the sheriff's department uh, and they they took care of the county and then the LAPD they took care of the city they they did roundups uh they just swept through all of the working class neighborhoods uh, and the rural neighborhoods of of both Los Angeles County but also Los Angeles and just picked kids up off the street and processed them through their uh, their system fingerprinted them took their pictures booked them held them and there were, so there were mass roundups of, of young people, all in an effort to try and figure out who killed Jose Diaz. And eventually, in the process of questioning uh, young people, uh, the the young uh, the young uh, the neighborhood of 38th Street was identified as the ones who were responsible for Jose Diaz's death. But I should say that, you know, this was very common in the 1940s that, you know, questioning wasn't just sitting you down in, in a room and saying, okay, tell us what you know. Uh, this, was, this was usually asking you that question after you were slapped around a couple times or even hit uh, with a fist or with a blackjack. I mean, they were pretty, pretty rough in the 1940s. This was long before your Miranda rights. Mm, right. And they rounded up, I, I think, 500 plus people. Um, yeah, up to six hundred. Yeah, yeah, up yeah to quite a few. People. And yeah. and when they rounded those people up, uh, were they predominantly Mexican Americans, or did that also kind of span different ethnicities? It spanned uh, different ethnicities, but again, when you're dealing with working class neighborhoods, the majority of them are going to be Mexican American. Mm-hmm. But we're also talking about other immigrants who are living in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a very diversified city at this time, as as it still is today. 
Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about other immigrant youth, we're talking about Russian Jews, Italians, Greeks, Armenians, um, Filipinos, uh, you know, so the list goes on. But, yeah, I would say the majority of them were, were largely Mexican-Americans because they were the largest um, racial and ethnic minority in Los Angeles at the time. Right. And, and they stood out, too, right, because of the fashion at the time? So the fashion we're talking about is is jazz fashion, um, and and part of jazz fashion in the 1940s was was known as the zoot suit. Is popularly known as the zoot suit. Uh, the kids in Los Angeles didn't call it the zoot suit. On the East Coast, it was called the zoot suit, but on the West Coast, they called it the drape. They never called it the zoot suit, um, and it was uh, it was a fashion that was worn pr- primarily by men, young men, but it was worn across the color line you had you had white kids wearing uh the drape you had mexican-american kids wearing the drape filipino kids italian kids so um this was the marker of jazz fans and this was a fashion that was worn by jazz fans but i would i you also need to understand that that not all uh, youth wore this fashion because it was a very expensive piece of fashion to own. Right. Uh, it, it, it had to be, if you had it made from scratch, it would probably cost you two months wages, if not more. And a lot of young people couldn't afford to do that. So most young people and, uh, didn't have a zoot suit or a, the drape. Most young people didn't wear that. So you're saying, but the ones who did did stand out. You're absolutely right on that. Yeah, they stood out absolutely. So there were a number of incidences between Sleepy Lagoon and between the Zoot Suit riots that were essentially clashes between uh, young Mexican Americans uh, or youth, anyways, and sailors. And and part of that was over the access cloth that was associated with Zoot Suits. Am I correct? Because at that time they had cloth rationing. The clashes that I found, and I was able to find um, complaint logs that were comp- uh, that were issued or filed with the LAPD before the outbreak of the riot in 1943. And in looking at all of these complaints, I was able to compile uh, the very first complaints and the escalation of complaints as well, and where they were happening. And the the vast majority of complaints um, happened between uh, what is now kind of Dodger Stadium, uh, the Chavez Ravine, and downtown Los Angeles. And the reason why this, this corridor is important was that in, in uh, 1940, the city of Los Angeles put a military training facility in Chavez Ravine. Now, this is before Dodger Stadium was put there. Okay, okay. And, and, and Chavez Ravine uh, was always, it, it was always a Mexican-American neighborhood. Um, but there were also a appreciable number of Jews that were living there. Again, because Jews were segregated uh, along with African Americans and Mexican Americans as well. So it was unincorporated. So you have dirt roads, you have outhouses as well. And in the city of Los Angeles, in putting this training facility in Chavez Ravine, they exercised the right of eminent domain. So they claim land that families had been living on, kicked them out and put this, what was then a million dollar facility. Now, this is $1940, right? So it was a very expensive facility that was to be used for the training of naval officers, which was a segregated military branch at the time. So in the middle of these Mexican-American homes that had been there since the 1850s, uh, you're now putting a segregated uh, million dollar facility for white military officers. And in order for these military officers to get to downtown Los Angeles, they had to walk through these working class neighborhoods. And these clashes happened as these, these white officers were leaving their post and walking the neighborhoods to get to downtown Los Angeles. And so you see these escalating series of clashes as, uh, as these, these uh, military men are walking uh, to and from downtown Los Angeles. And now, why these clashes happen, it depends on who you're asking. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of the military officers, it's like, hey, we're just minding our own business, right? We're just walking down these neighborhoods. But from the the perspective of the the 
the residents who are living in these neighborhoods. And again, it's very integrated. Majority Mexican American, but again, you have Italians living there, you have Armenians living there, you have Russian Jews living there as well. From their perspective, these military men are swaggering down their neighborhoods. They're insulting their mothers and their wives and their daughters. And these men are simply standing up for decency and morality by saying to these military men at first, you can't treat our mother this way. You can't treat my sister this way. And, and so at first, the complaints are about verbal harassment. And then the, the complaints begin to escalate towards physical harassment. And then the complaints then move from physical harassment to actual fighting, fisticuffs, right, before the outbreak of the riot. And so the tensions on the street begin to grow over time. And again, from the military perspective, it's like, hey, we're just walking down through these neighborhoods. We're minding our own business. But from the perspective of these, the, the residents there, it's these military men are, are uh, offensive. And they're trying to proposition our mothers and our sisters, and, and the language they use is, is vulgar. And, and we're just, you know, you know, we're trying to stand up and protect our, our, our families. Now, how much did the backdrop of being in the middle of a war and nationalistic sentiment play a role in, in the two sides um, also having friction? You know, that's, that's a very interesting question, because um, y- using the language of the time, there were, there were people who criticized anyone who challenged someone in the, the military as being unpatriotic. You know, how, how dare you do this? These, this young man is, is going off to give his life. How dare you push back at this military officer? But, you know, the Mexican Americans volunteered to fight in the war. And in fact, there have been studies that they're among the highest decorated uh, group of, of people who served in the military as well. So they weren't against the war, and they weren't anti-military. What they were against were assaults against their family and against their norms and, their, and the decency of their neighborhoods, right? That's what they were against. And so, but, you know, from the perspective of other people, it's like these people are, are being unpatriotic, right? They're, they're fighting against military men who are giving their lives to defend this country. How dare they, right? So, again, it's one of those complicated strands that get, that get really messed up in this spaghetti bowl of tensions of this period. Okay, so but I mean, I would say the the bottom line is that they were not being un- unpatriotic. They were just trying to defend their families. But from the other side, people certainly saw those that defensive family as being unpatriotic. So they round up six hundred youth or so. Um, they release yeah. uh, most of them, but they keep uh, sixteen or seventeen of them uh, that go on trial. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So they go on trial. Now, do they get convicted? Well, yeah, I just want to add this 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 part. So they, you know, they they uh, they eventually the the LAPD eventually um, and the sheriff's department they focus in on the 38th Street kids, um, and their questioning is is violent by any standard, even even more so by our modern standard. I mean, the the descriptions, and and these are coming from the attorneys who represented them you know they one attorney in particular walked into the room where her client was being questioned and the the young man his t-shirt was just bloodied from the blood dripping from his nose because he had been beaten so resoundingly by the the detectives who were questioning him and so and in fact these kids when they're on the, the finally on the witness stand and you know the the prosecuting attorney is asking well why did you confess and the kids are saying, it's because we're being beaten up. You know, what else were we going to do? What else were we going to say? Right. Um, you know, so I, I just want to throw that in there was that, you know, the, the investigation into the trial was fraught with what I would characterize as misconduct. And I think most people today would characterize it as, as misconduct. Mm-hmm. Back in the 1940s, this was normal. This was absolutely normal, particularly when you're dealing with minority uh, people. Uh, they would just brutalize until you would confess because the, the suspicion was, well, you're never going to confess, even if you did it. So we have to get the confession out of you. So, yes, yeah, so this eventually leads to the trial. So how did between the conviction, um, what happened between then and the Zoot Suit riots that led up to, the, to a point to where it boiled over so much that you had, you know, the, the, the infamous Zoot Suit riots? Yeah, so 
the point that I make in my book is that, you know, the, the murder trial, so the murder trial ends in January of 1943, and the riot breaks out in June of 1943, so it's about a six-month period mm-hmm. between the, the, the outcome. Now, it, it wasn't like the Simi Valley verdict, you know, for example, you know, where you see this immediate response to, you know, the Rodney King incident, right, to this immediate response to a trial outcome. It wasn't anything like that. So there wasn't a direct causal link between the outcome of the trial where, where the, the young men of 38th Street were all sent to, to prison of various kinds, depending on, they didn't all get sent to San Quentin. They weren't all convicted of murder of, of Jose Diaz. Some of them were sent to uh, juvenile delinquency uh, training camps and things of that. Yeah, but, but all of them were, almost all of them were convicted. There were a few that were, that were not convicted. Um, but there wasn't a direct causal link between the convictions and the right itself, but they were all part of this larger, larger piece uh, of tensions around the issue of perceived juvenile delinquency and this notion that you've got a large immigrant slash refugee population that is a social danger. That's, that's how they connect, because it's all part of this larger discussion and perception. So you have the Zoot Suit riots. Now, at this time, uh, are those youth still, are they still in jail? The, the one yeah, so the 30 East Street kids, they're, they're already in, in uh, some of them are in San Quentin for life. Um, some of them are in uh, training camps, juvenile, you know, but they're in, in various parts of the, the correctional right. system, uh, various um, um, avenues. Okay. Um, and they're, they're not on the streets when the riot break out. They're shocked when they read about the, the what no, comes to be known as the Zutsu riot. Okay. Um, yeah. So what happens after the Zutsu riots? Did, uh, did well, so the riot breaks out. Well, here's my point, is, is that when the riot breaks out in June of 1943, it was an immediate retaliation against those neighborhoods um, that lay between the military facility in Chavez Ravine and downtown Los Angeles. That was the first night of rioting when the military personnel attacked all, anyone they could find on that corridor. Um, that, you know, because that was kind of the the corridor of, of building harassment and tension that had been growing since uh, 1941, 1942. So that was the first night of rioting. But then in subsequent nights, uh, the riot just spreads. And both military and civilians in Los Angeles began to go into East Los Angeles mm. and seek out anyone they could find, but also into uh, Watts, uh, into South Central. Uh, African-American neighborhoods as well. And that's when the riot um, turns from being a retaliatory action against street harassment to being a race riot. Mm. There's no reason to target Watts, for example. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to target East L.A. The only reason why they actually took taxi cabs to get there was because they were striking deep in the heart of of racialized communities such as East L.A. and also South Central uh, into Watts. So I've always been under the assumption that this moment unified neighborhoods and gangs in a way that they hadn't been leading up to that moment. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You know, what's interesting is is that so this riot was was a riot predominantly of both military and civilians ostensibly attacking anyone they could find wearing the drape. Mm-hmm. But they were happy to include anyone else who either mouthed off or who looked suspicious or who didn't run from the streets. And so the, 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 the rioting servicemen and civilians didn't restrict themselves only to minority youth. They also attacked white kids um, who were also working class white kids. That's right. Um, anyone, anyone who got in the way. Um, so... Um, that was the nature of the right. Now, your question again, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> drew a blank on, on what you just asked. Um, well, I've always been, so I've always kind of put forth the theory that um, one of the things that changed about gangs um, in the 1940s. Oh, it was the unifying. Yeah, yeah. it was the unifying See, factors that happened. In yeah. The yeah. Well, this is, this is what's interesting is, is that, it, so 
young people actually fought back, but they fought back in very interesting ways. I mean, they actually laid trap traps for uh, for some of the uh, the riders, um, and they. You know, we're, we're talking about young, you know, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, you know, against 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, you know, have been trained in, in boot camp. And, and, uh, but they, they did. They, they fought back, and they, they kind of organized in that way. Uh, but again, I would argue, I would push hard against the, the idea that bona fide gangs existed in the 1940s. Now, again, not in the ways that we think about gangs today. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. So I feel like it was one of many factors that eventually led to the modern-day gangs that we would see now. Um, now, I use gang loosely when I refer to bands of youth of 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We're really talking about neighborhoods and clubs and things like that. Um, but yeah. when you had uh, the Zoot Suit Riots um, and, and things like that, you, you have these neighborhoods that basically unify in ways that they had not been unified before. Like, now there's direct violence that's happening to them in their neighborhoods. And like you said, the gut reaction is to protect the neighborhood, to protect your family, to protect your name. Um, and yeah. that became um, kind of a, a pillar, a moment that um, would play into the larger creation of gangs as, as drugs were introduced to the streets later in time and, and a bunch of other social factors and things like that. You know, that's certainly one way of looking at it. I, I tend to look to a later moment in time when gangs as we know them today as organized criminal enterprises and again, I'm thinking about MS-13, for example. I'm thinking about the Bloods and the Crips, uh, the Mexican Mafia. The list goes on and on. Um, they, I, th I think it was really the advent of, of cheap street drugs um, that really kind of put gas to the rise of gangs as we know them today. From, from my perspective, and this could be one of my blinders, but from my perspective, as I look back to the 1940s, and I would even put this in the 1950s, again, these are, these are just kids who are trying to find their way in the world, quite honestly. You know, um, you know 1940s, 1950s, this is the era of segregation. And it's, it's not just racial segregation, it's also economic segregation. Um, and if, if you're on the, the outside of what it means to be segregated, if you know what I mean, you know, if, if you're on that list of people, you know, who have to sit at the back of the bus or sit at the back of the theater or who are denied opportunities, you know, what have you got? You know, and all you have are each other and the friendships that you've got in your neighborhoods as well. And, you know, so I, from my view, I look at the 1940s and 1950s as, as you know, people just trying to, trying to make their way in this world. And, and things really change in a qualitatively different way, uh, really towards the end of the 70s and into the 80s when you've got uh, cheap drugs that are widely available and suddenly uh, money uh, becomes a, a significant factor, and that's when I start to see things changing in a dramatic way, in a way that we recognize now. So, right. um, I, do, I don't see it quite so much then, so and I don't me, see the the. Let yeah. me throw out some some things to you yeah. and, and get your thoughts on this. So, yeah, um, you had long before drugs were introduced to the streets, which undoubtedly had a tremendous impact on, on the evolution of gangs um, and, and the violence associated with gangs. Um, you still had the formation of the Mexican Mafia, of, um, you know, various other prison gangs that were formed out of protection. One of yeah. the things that I thought was interesting is that the, the group from 38th Street, from the neighborhood 38th Street, that was incarcerated their cases were eventually overturned right and they were re they were released. That's right, yeah. okay so yeah. were, now that was a pretty big moment when they were released um because yeah. for one it had solidified what some people had thought which is they weren't guilty to begin with but two they were kind of right. seen as heroes to other mexican-american youth when they came out or yeah not. yeah yeah i think so yeah i okay. think that's fair now, I, I've always wondered, um, and I've read different theories about this, as to whether or not them coming back out, bringing some of the, the prison style um, back out onto the streets, mixing that with the Pachuco style, if that played a role in, in kind of that, that, you begin to see that formation of that iconic Cholo style, which draws oh, from, from early yeah. Pachuco days, um, and then it mixes prison style. Um, and that yeah. style blended together is still there today. 
You know, it's kind of oh, yeah, persisted yeah. through all those years. And I've always thought that was really interesting. Just the gang politics aside, stylistically speaking, there's no denying that there's, yeah. you know, you can trace that to those to those roots. Um, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on whether or not um, their release precipitated anything um, as a result, or did that add to tensions at the time between sailors, or did it eventually just kind of fizzle out? For those military personnel that were involved in the riot, they were they were already off fighting the war, and who knows? I don't even know if they were still alive at that time. Um, so they were gone. In other words, they were gone from the scene. They were gone from Southern California. Um, but I think you're right. I I would agree with you that in terms of kind of the prison life, la vida dura. Mm-hmm. Um, that's always been uh, a kind of a tragic reality of growing up racialized and um, denied uh, kind of mainstream opportunities in the United States. Is that, and particularly when you're criminalized, um, that's always been a part of, of the Mexican-American experience. Now, um, in terms of its growing, uh, how do I say this? Um, in terms of that uh, prison culture being a common facet of Mexican-American youth, it's, it's, I don't know, I would say it's still, it's only a segment. Mm-hmm. It's only a segment of the larger Mexican-American population, and I think it always has been. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that every Mexican-American male has been through prison. It's common sure. enough. Yeah. Um, and in, in large families, you're, you're likely to have at least one relative who's been incarcerated, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that everyone uh, kind of picks up on, um, uh, on, on prison culture. Right. And, Although as I'm speaking and, 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 you know, again, I'm trying, I haven't thought about this. This yeah. is a good question. Well, and I'm not suggesting this, that, that that's the case. Um, I'm, you yeah. know, I think about these things. So for example, I'm, I'm really involved with, um, with the low rider community and, I grew up around that, and uh, I was at a show I don't know, a few weeks back ago in, in Los Angeles, and I was struck, and I always am, on the amount of zoot suits I saw. Um, I was struck on just that longing for the traditional Pachuco culture, and I'm always struck yeah. by the persistent style that's associated with prisons, which is uh, you know, the, the khakis, white T-shirts. Right. Um, these are yeah. things that have, I mean, lasted a long time. I mean, the, the, the stylistic yeah. elements associated with kind of that outsider mentality with a segment, a subset of Chicanos, right, of yeah. particularly urban Chicano youth, I guess you would say, um, yeah. it's been pretty enduring and pretty consistent. And, and I've just I've yeah. always found that fascinating. Yeah, I don't disagree with you at all. In fact, as I was trying to think about, it, in addition to that, I would add that, you know, for example, the shaved head, mm-hmm. uh, the, the baggy clothing, um, all of that um, is a part of that. Um, you don't even have to I, be a gang member, I mean, to have a lot of right. And that some, sometimes the, the, yeah. it, the shame is that, and I remember when I used to drive my Impala, I used to get pulled over every day in that thing, every day. But, you know, there's... There's a lot of misnomers, stylistically speaking. I think car shows are kind of a, a good example of that. Because you can go to a car show, and you could see plenty of people who aren't gang members at all. But I think yeah. average people would look at them and assume they were gang members because of how they right. dressed. And they'd, They're you know, styling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of little subtleties, I guess, that people aren't aware of and, and things that are they're just little nuances in the culture and in style that the average onlooker would probably miss. Now, I haven't given thought to when that became a, a dominant part of Mexican-American culture. Um, so that's a great question, and honestly, I have not thought about that. Yeah. Um, but to, to your question or to your observation about the, the, the zoot suit at, at, in car culture today, so my observation, um, and again, I, I would point out that what they wore in the 1940s in Southern California uh, was not a zoot suit. And what kids wear today is not what they wore in the 1940s. What they wear today is what they see coming out of the creation of Luis Valdez's play and movie. Hmm. And, and this is where I try in my book, is I really try and break down the, the Luis Valdez construction of what a pachuco was. 
because if you again if you went back in time if you went back in the 1940s and you asked somebody what's a pachuco they wouldn't point to a kid wearing a zoot suit or a drape that was a jazz fan and jazz and pachucos had nothing to do with each other mm-hmm. but was well, it an attitude okay. and a mindset more than it was a style so pachucos uh, as far as i can determine uh, the term came from uh slang for someone who came from el paso and um and depending on who used it it was either um it was either a pejorative term or an ameliorative term. So it was either a positive or a negative term, um, depending on the context. It could either be calling someone just a hick or someone a dandy, right? So it all depended on the context and the way that you used it. Um, but the drape was not connected with pachucos in the 1940s. Uh, pachucos were something qualitatively different. These are, again, these are people coming from Los Angeles. Um, I believe that in Los Angeles there were there was a group known as Tirilis, Tirilis or Tirilones um, uh, were probably rum runners. Uh, this and coming out of the the era of prohibition, they operated on the on the border. Um, they may have been American Indian. They may have been Otomi Indians. Uh, we don't know. Um, but they, there definitely was a subculture there, um, and they bore many of the characteristics that are associated with, with quote unquote pachucos. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't they didn't wear uh, the drape again. I mean, that's a construction of Luis Valdez. Mm-hmm. They didn't wear a drape. It's kind of a a big thing in the Mexican American community of this identity of kind of feeling like you're trapped in the middle, but you have yeah. this tremendous pride of living in the United States, and you're proud to be American, but you don't yeah. you don't get rid of your heritage, and you're proud of your right. heritage and your culture. And people seem so confused how somebody can identify as a Mexican American, or they can identify, right. you know, with both cultures. But to me, it makes so much sense because I mean, for me, that's how that's how I grew up. That's how I've always viewed myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you see it with with sports athletes who identify as as Mexican Americans or, you know, you see people online questioning why, why is he flying a Mexican flag? You know, he's not proud to be American. Yeah. It doesn't mean any of that. Yeah. But, you know, you and I also live in a time after Chicano nationalism flourished in the, in the seventies uh, and eighties as well, where there's a, there was a defined moment where uh, people like us said, this is how we're going to define ourselves on our own terms. Back in the 40s, there was nothing like that. And so a lot of these kids, uh, you know, the, the 38th Street, who are seen as the quintessential pachucos, they didn't speak Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only, the only world they ever knew was, was the United States. And they never saw themselves as kind of cultural freedom fighters. They never saw that. They never saw themselves as striking a blow for, you know, mestizaje or anything like that. You know, we look back through the lens of cultural nationalism to see that. But in in my talking to them and in all the articulations I could find from them, it, that just wasn't on their radar screen back then. It's really interesting that you bring that up, um, and I won't go too far into you know off the topic. But um, when you mentioned that they didn't even speak Spanish, that's something yeah. that a lot of people aren't aware of with with a lot of the gangs in the in the sixties and seventies before they kind of became what they yeah. are now is yeah. for a long time, a lot of the Chicano gangs or neighborhoods, they wouldn't let people in from Mexico. They were, yeah. you had to be born in the United States. And that led to yeah. the creation of some of the biggest transnational gangs that we see today. Yeah, um, yeah. Some of them branched off, for example, from, from Clanton. You had um, 18th Street that branched off from Clanton. You had, you know, um, Marisaba Trucha and, all, you know, different different gigantic gangs that were essentially made up of, of immigrants. Um, yeah. So I, I always because of prejudice, nice. sadly. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people aren't aware of that. That that was happening within the Chicano community for a long time, and probably to an extent still happens. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of a sad, sad irony. Yeah. So how do you see? Yeah. Um, do you see any parallels between what was happening in the, in the 1940s and what's happening right now? Because when I when I look at right yeah. now, I see, I see nationalism. Um, mm-hmm. It's not necessarily the direct result of a specific war, but I see nationalism. I see uh, a, lo- a large debate surrounding um, immigration, um, and, and you almost yeah. can never talk about immigration without mentioning uh, 
uh, Mexican Americans and Mexicans, even though yeah. a lot of people coming right now are from Central America, um, they're almost go under you know going through what I feel like what Mexicans had already been through to a large yeah. extent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just curious to to hear your thoughts on whether or not we've learned anything, or or if this is just something that's just going to continue to repeat itself. Yeah, it's a famous phrase that those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are there are some sad parallels. Um, uh, I, it's a fine line between uh, nationalism and white nationalism. I would say it's a very fine line, um, and so we see the the rise of nationalism today. We see the demonization of immigrants, particularly immigrants who are coming in from south of the border. And yes, they they are largely Central American and and not Mexican American as they. They were in the 1940s, but yes, we see that same kind of language, that same kind of demonization. Um, uh, so there are some parallels between then and now. Uh, where things are significantly different, on the other hand, is that we don't live with segregation. And I would, I would argue that you and I are integrated in a ways that, that just they could only dream of back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's a legacy of that as well. And so, you know, because we're, we're integrated, you know, we have access to, to power in ways that didn't exist back then. So there are some parallels, um, sadly, um, but there are also some, some significant differences. I often think about this very thing. I think about the different um, ethnicities and nations and cultures who have come to the United States, right? You think about the Irish and the Italians, for example, that yeah. for a long time, uh, you know, that famous sign, uh, Irish no need apply, and um, you had yeah. Jews and, and, and all of these different types of people who underwent um, lengths of discrimination before they finally kind of integrated into the United States. Uh, you saw it with the Japanese. And I always felt like, for some reason, with Mexicans, it, it lasted longer even though there was more of them. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you, you see the Italians and Irish eventually get integrated into the system to where they're not even really considered mm-hmm. immigrants anymore, right? People just refer to them yeah. as white people. But Mexicans, it seems like that argument has lasted 100 years. I think it's more varied uh, when we're dealing with the Mexican-American population. Um, so for the Irish, and this is a historical controversy, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stake my, my part on this because I've actually seen it um uh, i've i've actually seen into the 20th century um want ads that that end with no irish need apply so we're we're dealing with you know the early 1910s and if you consider the kind of the 1840s as the pinnacle moment when the irish are coming into the united states you know that's an awfully long time you know to have that overt discrimination towards the irish who are effectively white just to look at them, right? Mm-hmm. But are, are racialized in, in, nonetheless in, in the same ways as, as many other people. For Mexican-Americans, if, if you want to uh, mark, there, there are different ways in which you can mark uh, the presence of Mexican-Americans in the United States. Uh, some of us were here before the United States came, mm-hmm. but the majority of, of Mexican-Americans came after the revolution. So between 1910 and 1920, that's when uh, most refugees came to the United States and stayed. So, you know, it's been about 80 years, uh, if you want to start, take 1920. You know, many of us are integrated, um, but I think what makes things different, though, is that unlike other immigrant groups, because we are so close to the border, we maintain ties with Mexico and with Mexican culture in a way that was not possible uh, for uh, Italians or for the Irish, mm. uh, when they came across, and I would also add technology. I mean, technology allows us to, to maintain. We can watch telenovelas at, at our at our wish, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, if you went back to the 1840s, when you crossed the ocean, that was it. Uh, you were you were never going back. And so, the process of cultural assimilation was a one way street. You just started on that path until your children looked and acted like Americans. Whereas here, culturally, uh, yeah, you can still assimilate if you want to, but, you know, we still have many, many ties to, to Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's, no, there's no need to give up on those ties. Yeah. I don't think there's um, any there's, getting around it, <laughs> to be honest with well, you. Well, I, mean, I just I don't, I don't see any, I just don't see any need. I mean, wh- why do I have to, 
I can still eat the foods that I, uh, I can go out, I can pay for, you know, I can go to restaurants and eat the foods that I grew up eating, you know. Mm-hmm. Why, why should I have to, you know, uh, eat at, uh, I don't know, uh, Burger King? Or, you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I can, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm teaching my children Spanish, you know. Why? Because we live in the Southwest, you know. I mean, this is just the language of this area, you know. It just makes all, all kinds of sense, but it's, I have a very good friend who's actually from Northern Ireland. Um, he lives here, and uh, it, it's it's very different for him. He's not going back, and I kind of get it from that perspective. Like, if you're not going back to the home country, and you've married an American, and your children are going to be raised American, you're going to just assimilate like everyone else. But here in the Southwest, uh, you know, we're connected to we're Greater Mexico. Mm-hmm. And that's just reality. And so those cultural ties are going to be apparent for much, much longer. Well, there's a price to be paid for that. There is. Um, you know, if, if you want to assimilate into American culture, you can. Um, if you want to act like all Americans, you can. But if you stand out, if you deviate from that, there are some prices to be paid for that. So... You know, we, 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 we make that choice as Mexican-Americans. Sure, yeah. And, I, you know, I've always felt that part of what makes the West so beautiful is, is the influence that Mexican-Americans have had on it through art, yeah. through music, through yeah. food. Um, you know, it's just so beautiful and it's so different. Um, and I always miss it when I travel to the East Coast. Not to say there's not culture in the yeah. East Coast, but it's different. And you you grew up yeah. in the West. I'm, I'm assuming you grew up... Uh, did you grow up in the West? I know that you're in Arizona. I right did, now, yeah. Right? Yeah. So you understand yeah. that. And, um, you know, there's just no no replacing it. And that's through years and years and decades of, of influence. Um, I yeah. could probably sit and talk to you all day about a lot of different things. <laughs> but before I let you go, uh, you have another book that you just wrote last year, correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want yeah. to tell our, our listeners about that book and how they can find it? Yeah, yeah. So this was with the University of Oklahoma Press, and it's called Valley of the Guns, the Pleasant Valley War and the Trauma of Violence. And this uh, this book looks at a small community in northern Arizona that just collapsed on itself into a state of civil war. And people who had been living together as neighbors and friends uh, started assassinating one another. Um, and when it was all over, uh, you know, there were 18 people who lost their lives violently. And so I, I look into, first of all, what happened? How does a community get to that point where, you know, death is the only answer or murder is the only answer? But I, I also, what I bring to the table is, is, is I, I, I explore the role of the trauma of violence in the settling of the West and how it was a significant factor that really warped the lives of everybody that was engaged in trying to settle the West, from the American Indians to the American settlers as well. Um, it was a significant factor that, that wounded everybody. And we don't talk about that in, in our national narratives. I mean, it's always this glorious epic, right. you know, of riding off into the sunset. And, and you know, the indifference to death uh, is, is one of the, the hallmark features of Westerns. And that just wasn't the case. Uh, people weren't indifferent to death, and they weren't indifferent to, to violence. Violence had a tremendous impact on everybody, and it warped people. And it, it then it had an impact on their choices and what they did next. And so that's what I'm trying to bring back to the kind of the discussion is just our appreciation of how trauma was a significant factor in historical events, particularly in the settling of the West. And where's the best place that listeners can find your newest book? You know, I think probably Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon as well. Uh, you can you can find it there. All right, Eduardo, I want to thank you for coming onto the podcast. Or coming onto the podcast, uh, this has been extremely informative and interesting. Um, I hope you decide to come back and join us again sometime in the future. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that conversation to be thoroughly fascinating, and I probably could have kept it going for at least another hour or so. Uh, In any case, I hope you enjoyed the podcast as well. I hope you join us again next week for our next podcast. Until then, continue to visit us at dailychella.com. Also, make sure to follow us on social media at Daily Chella. Thank you for listening. Have a great week. (music) 